Bobbish. Hello everybody and welcome to the talk of uh, Franz um, Thoma uh, about leveraging two algebraic data types. Uh, Franz is originally a physicist and works as a consultant and software engineer at TNG Technology Consulting in Munich. And he loves functional languages and expressive type systems. Yeah, um, let's listen to his talk and enjoy. Thank you. Yeah, so um, as a consultant, uh, usually I have to use the tools and languages that, um, that the client uh, has or provides and uh, the client wants. And uh, so although I'm, uh, I'm very keen about uh, functional programming and Haskell in particular, usually I can't use that uh, technology directly at the, at the client. So I'm always keen about uh, how to, how to transfer uh, tools and techniques from Haskell, from functional programming, to the, the languages I actually use. And, um, well, this, is, this talk is about one thing that uh, I really enjoy about uh, uh, functional languages in general, Haskell in particular, which is algebraic data types. So, ah. so. Let's start with, uh, um, by the way, a quick question. Uh, who is familiar with uh, Haskell syntax here? All right, so most probably. Yeah, uh, so there's, there's a bit uh, Haskell um, syntax required, but apart from that, hopefully uh, we'll get along with our deep knowledge about the Haskell uh, type system or Haskell um, language. So let's start. What is an algebraic data type? The, the simplest, uh, simplest case of an algebraic data type, or one of the simplest cases, uh, are enums. So uh, the bool type, for example, it has, uh, is, uh, has two, two constructors, two enum constants, if you like, that's true and false. So a, a value of type bool can either be true or false. Um, there are more complex variants of uh, algebraic data types, like for example the maybe type. Maybe, uh, to, to, uh, to some, this may be known as the optional type uh, with absent and present in Java, or the option type with sum and none in Scala. But basically, it's, uh, it's the very same, con uh, the same concept. And there you also have two variants, uh, nothing and just. But in this case, um, the, the, the just uh, is not an enum constant, but rather uh, a, a so-called constructor that takes a value of type A um, and produces a value of type maybe A. And there are also other, uh, other um, uh, yeah, different types like the, the pair type, where you don't have two different constants, but rather uh, one constructor that takes two values, and you also can mix those two, like for example the list type. So this is, um, I'm not using the, the native Haskell list type, but rather I'm writing my own list type here, and uh, we have two constructors, that's nil, again doesn't take any value, that's the, the empty list, and we have cons, the uh, list constructor that takes a, a value and a list, and appends this uh, value to the list. So it creates a, a new list from a value and, uh, and the rest of the list. Um, why are those uh, data types called algebraic? Um, because, well, an algebraic mathematics is basically something, in layman's terms, where you can add and multiply. And uh, if, you, if you see these, uh, these options here, true or false, basically is one, uh, one option for true and one for false, so you have plus. This type is like a plus. Here for maybe, you have all the values of nothing, so that's only one, and all the values of just, and that's everything that A provides. So it's one plus all the values of, of A. For pair, you have multiplication. You have all the values of A times all the value of B, so it's the Cartesian product, basically. And here you even combine those two, so you have uh, 
addition and multiplication in one. So that's why they're called algebraic. But basically, you can forget uh, you can forget about this uh, algebra thing. And uh, so, let's just roll with these uh, examples. Um, these are the four examples I'm going to use throughout uh, this talk. So, it's especially maybe. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'll leave this on for uh, for a few more seconds, and then we're going to uh, to start. By the way, if there are um, if there are questions, so small questions, uh, let's just uh, do them directly during the talk. So this is a bit more interactive. If you have a large question or uh, you want to discuss something, then we should do it at the end. All right. So um, what I usually use are uh, in, in client projects are object-oriented languages, and in OOP. You uh, also have data types, of course, they are called classes, and they, a class actually has four purposes, or it does four things at once. It defines a type, it defines a data structure, it defines operations on that data structure, and it scopes. And let's uh, use a small example for that. So if I declare a class called pair, for example, then it uh, that induces a type. So you can't, you can't have, in Java for example, you can't have a type without declaring a class. Uh, this class can have fields. These are, this is the data associated with, with a type. And you have uh, operations, so methods, uh, they, they are uh, defined the behavior of the class and, um, and uh, they can operate on the on the types uh, on, on the fields on the, the data of the class. So you can't have a class without fields, or you, well, you can obviously not declare any fields. But uh, there is no distinction between the data of a class and the operations in a class. Um, although you have patterns where you only where you have value objects that only use fields and behavioral services that hopefully don't have any state. Basically, there is, there is no distinction between these two. Um, and we use, we have the curly braces around all this, so we, the, the class also defines a scope for, uh, for these fields and uh, the operations, and in that way it provides information hiding. Now, in functional programming, we have a very different approach. Um, algebraic data types, they separate all of these four uh, concerns. So, for example, a, type, uh, a data type declaration for a pair, um, it has a type constructor, a type declaration, but doesn't have any data a priori. So everything left from the equals sign is just the type declaration. And to the right, we have the so-called constructors. They are the, uh, the, the data structure. In Haskell, you can have t types without data. Um, so uh, these two concepts are, or you can use new types without, uh, without declaring a new data structure. So these two are separated. And what's even more, uh, the operations are completely separated from the data declaration. So uh, they can be even defined in a totally different module. And also the scoping is totally uh, independent from data types. Uh, they are, uh, scoping is usually done in a module system, so scoping and information hiding. It's done in a module system, so you can have multiple uh, data types within one module, uh, or not have any data types in the module at all, so they're, they're totally uncorrelated. Um, now, this has a, two, uh, a few uh, advantages. Um, so why, why would I want to use it? Um, decoupling operations from types has some advantages. Um, and decoupling, so uh, that means you can, induce, you can induce new types without always having to, uh, to, to create a data structure alongside. Um, also, decoupling data from types, same, uh, uh, same thing. Um, the separation between data and operations, and in particular, the extensibility that comes with it. Um, so, 
you, uh, if in, in OOP, if you want to extend that class, if you want to add an operation to a type, then you always have to, to, uh, to derive from that class and then use a new type, which you probably don't want. And that leads to all the that leads to all the casting you usually do in, in OOP because you extended something, you added behavior, but uh, someone is typing thing on the base type, so you lose the information uh, of that of those additional uh, operations, even though it's actually there. So you kind of tell the compiler, I know what I'm doing, I know that it's this subtype, except for when it isn't, and you get class cast errors, obviously. So, yeah, of course, a few disadvantages, disadvantages come uh, with it as well. Um, in particular, in order to make operations extensible, you have to, uh, to expose internal structure. So, in the, in the Java example, uh, here we have this, the, we did encapsulate and hide the implementation details, whereas in the Haskell example, we exposed it so that everybody could use uh, the, um, the the internal structure. But you could uh, make the uh, you could make it private. Yes, I could make you it could private make to the to the module, module of course. And and then then I I'd also lose the extensibility to to a certain amount. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> now, the true power of ADTs actually comes from pattern matching. Um, so you can not only create a, 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 an instance of an algebraic data types using the constructors, but you can use the constructors also to decompose it. For example, we could uh, write a, a function called if then else, and it takes uh, three, three parameters, a Boolean expression, an expression that's to be evaluated if, you, uh, if it's true, and one for false. And we match on the Boolean expression, check whether it is true, then we uh, evaluate the then expression, or if, when it's false, then we evaluate the else expression. Um, so, basically you can write if then else as a function as opposed to a language construct. Um, in, in Haskell, this function actually exists and it's called <coughs> simply with a small, uh, not capital, but small d. Um, <coughs> Another example for maybe, you can write something like or else. So you have a maybe, you want to, you want to extract a value, but in the case you have nothing, you need to, to provide a fallback. That's, so you have a maybe thing and a fallback, and if the maybe thing is nothing, you don't have, you don't have anything, then you return the fallback. If you do have something, then you can just, can just return it. <clears throat> so you have this uh, with ADTs. You have this kind of duality. You have the constructors that um, create values of a type, and you have the patterns. And the patterns are directly induced by the by the constructors. Uh, the patterns that decompose the type. And we can use this. So I'm I'm giving you a preview of what we uh, we want to achieve in a totally different language in TypeScript this time. Um, uh, just encoding the um, this, the same type maybe, but as a, as an algebraic data type, but in a different language. <clears throat> and then I'm going to explain it how to how to get there, how to derive this, how to motivate this. <clears throat> so we have an, uh, we we declare an interface. So that's a type. We have uh, a function called match. That's the decomposition. And then we have two functions called nothing and just. Those are the constructors. And now I just, so I've declared the type, constructors, and now I can uh, add operations. And this is by declaring a class, for example, adding the or else function. And now we have something that looks very much like pattern matching. Namely, we have this match function. And we have a pattern for nothing and a pattern for just. And we give this function a fallback if we have a thing, then we return the thing, just. Or if we have nothing, then we return the fallback. So it's exactly the same for client code. And there's a bit more code for the, um, 
for encoding the, the maybe type, but for client code, it looks very much the same, except for a bit more, well, a few more curly braces, a few more uh, parentheses, and so on. Yes? Sorry, uh, doesn't this evaluate uh, the fallback always? Like, uh, the Haskell version is, doesn't, I think. Yes, it does. <clears throat> you could add a supplier here. Yeah. So, a, a function of that. Uh, but we are we are already in a strict language, right? Um, so we during pattern matching we have the possibility to uh, to be lazy, but this function isn't. It's just this function that isn't lazy. The the concept itself can be made or can be used in a lazy way. Yeah. So how do we arrive there? How do we uh, motivate motivate this? So in Functional programming, we, um, we have a thing called Scott encoding. That's one, one possibility to, to, use, um, to use lambda calculus to, uh, to encode uh, algebraic data types in a way where you don't actually need algebraic data, data types, so you don't need them as a language feature. You rather can just pull them out of thin air, basically. Um, and so let's let's look a bit uh, at the at the <coughs> structure of this um, of this maybe type. So declaring a data type maybe uh, induces two functions called nothing and just, and these are basically just uh, functions that. So nothing is a function that doesn't take any arguments; it just returns a maybe a. It is a constant of type maybe a, whereas just is a function that takes an a and returns a maybe a. Um, and in the, in the, in the standard Haskell standard library, there's also a function called maybe. So like the type, just with a small uh, m, lowercase. Um, and this also takes two arg three arguments actually. The first one is something is is just a constant. The second one is something that takes an a and returns something of type r. And if you compare this, then you have the R and the A to R here, and you have maybe A and A to maybe A here. So this this first argument kind of uh, kind of is the same, or it, it could take the nothing. The second one could take the just as an as an argument, and I kind of named the uh, the parameters already in a way that. Well, in a very suggestive way, that basically this nothing here, this first parameter, is the thing you do in case you have nothing, and the just is the thing you do in case you have the just. <clears throat> and this is called the so it's basically the uh, uh, it's the pattern matching encoded as a function. So it's the, the Scott decoding of the maybe type, and. Those two are kind of dual to one another. So if you use the maybe function on nothing and just, then it's just the same as doing nothing. You can literally, literally see it here. If you have maybe nothing just, so for the lowercase nothing here, you insert the uppercase nothing. So it returns just the same thing, and here exactly the same. So you you've written an identity function that just returns the same as it's, uh, uh, so the same thing that you put in comes out. Um, so that's the, the duality between those two. Um, yeah. <clears throat> every ADT, every algebraic data type, has this kind of dual representation, this elementary decomposition. <coughs> so if you, we've just seen it for maybe, um, for the bool, it's very simple. You have true and false, the constructors. You have two arguments, one for true, one for false. And we return either one depending on what is uh, what's, uh, what we put in. Sorry, yeah. is the previous example with identity. Yeah. I think it's also uh, different because of the Evaluation yes, the it's it's different because of laziness. Yes, we, we're 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 going to ignore laziness okay. uh, or non-strict evaluation for the entire talk. 
but yes, uh, so this, I should, should say that this uh, triple equal sign is kind of, uh, um, yeah, it's uh, up, to, up to bottom, up to uh, non-strict evaluation and so on. Well, where was I? Yes, and you may recognize here that this pool function, so in the Haskell standard library it's called pool. It's the same thing as the if then else we just had before. Um, for a pair, we have the very same thing. We have, the, we have a function that takes something that looks very much like this pair constructor function, takes this function and, well, it pattern matches on the pair, returns and applies this function to the, to the arguments. Same thing for lists. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I've, uh, so, and if, you, if you're a Haskell, if you already know a bit of Haskell, you may notice that this looks very much like full, except for one thing, it, it has a list here instead of the, the R. So Scott encoding is very, very, very similar to folds. It just handles recursion differently. So all of these functions are actually in the, in the prelude uh, with Par uh, partially even with the same names. This one isn't in the prelude, but uh, the fold is, and it just handles the recursion differently. So, how, how, can we, how can we leverage this? How can we use this in other languages? Well, we can reverse the construction. For normal ADTs, uh, you declare a data type, you declare constructors, and use these constructors for decomposition. With Scott encoding, you do it the other way around. You have the decomposition, and you create constructors from the decomposition. And the good thing is, we only need, we only require type lambda calculus, and most modern languages um, actually provide this. So every language that's ha that has a type system and has lambdas in one way or the other. Um, can use this. So, let's start. Um, we start with the maybe type, as before. We add a method to decompose it, and like, like we used before, we have one function that is called when we don't have anything, one that is called when we have a thing, and we both functions can return something, and when we call either of them, then we, we return, simply return the result. This is the, uh, the elementary decomposition. And now the constructors look, look like this. If uh, in the nothing case, so uh, I match, uh, I take those two functions and I return nothing. So I call the match nothing function. I just prefix everything with match in TypeScript because there, there would be a name clash. In Haskell, we don't have a name clash between constructors and uh, deconstruction because one is uppercase, one is lowercase, and they populate different namespaces. In TypeScript, we can't do that. Um, and the just function takes a thing, and we, uh, and we only use the match just function to apply it to the thing. And in the duality between those two is, is the very same. So we, we, if we create a just type, a uh, just value, and match it with the nothing and just constructors, it's just it returns the same thing. And if we take the nothing uh, constructor, match it with nothing and just, we get nothing back. So we've done the, the very same thing uh, as in Haskell just using a totally different language, implementing a few more lines of code, and it's the same thing. Now, the problem is, of course, this is, it's called Scott encoding. It's a concept from computer science, and you probably wouldn't want to use it uh, in a, in a code base maintained by, well, people who only know object-oriented programming. And they, they don't want to hear about Scott encoding and algebraic data types. But luckily, we have a different way to approach this. And 
and this different way is very much object oriented. That's from the, the infamous Gang of Four book called Design Patterns. And in this book, there's a pattern that looks very similar to this, and it's called the visitor pattern. <coughs> well, I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, the visitor pattern, so I'll just uh, give you a short overview. We're actually going to use the very same, uh, the same um, data type. So what the visitor pattern does, or what is <coughs> usually used, is syntax trees. To, um, to traverse syntax trees, you need to do a lot of, um, well, you need to, to know which, uh, which instance of a type you, you're, currently, um, you're currently handling. And for that, the uh, Gang of Four describes uh, the, uh, the so-called visitor pattern. We have an interface that's the basically the, the type of your abstract syntax tree, and this uh, every instance of this type should accept a visitor. And we have also another interface that's called visitor, and this one has different methods for all the possible instances of your type. And that can visit those uh, those different instances, and then of course we need implementations. So uh, this uh, um, this maybe interface has two implementations. One is called nothing. One is called just. And uh, the the nothing class always calls the visit nothing function. The just class the, the visit just functions. And if you yeah. Oh, why the name visit, by the way? You, well, I don't know. Can you explain why is it called, why is it called visitor visit? Or visit or, yeah. um, <clears throat> why is it called visitor? Um, it's usually for for it's usually used for syntax tree traverses, and in syntax tree traverses, you usually want to so you, you traverse the tree. You have the the, the notion of of nodes and sub children of nodes and basically you want to do something with every single node and the term that, that they coined for that is visiting that node. So you visit the volume of the node and then... Yeah. Okay. I, I kind of drop by the node, do something with the node, move on to the next node and that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's simply called visiting. Okay, thank you. So if you think this looks familiar then let's put the the pattern that I just uh, proposed to the to the other side. So we, in our pattern, we have a, also a visit nothing function, a visit just function. Just that in this case, those two are lambdas, and structurally, you see it's the very same thing. You just introduce uh, here. You introduce a, uh, a type called an interface called maybe visitor with two functions. Here, you just pass two anonymous functions. So it's worth noting that this pattern comes from a time where lambdas weren't available, whereas today you simply so at that time you, you weren't able to encode this, but now you can you can do it using lambdas, and the implementation is also almost the same, except for here you have classes. Classes have the disadvantages that they induce types. You don't want to have a type for nothing, you uh, because you don't want you the only way. You, for ADTs, you, uh, you want that the only way you can decompose this type is via pattern matching. Whereas if you have a nothing, then if you have a nothing type, then you always can type hint against it and you run into class casting or instance of and you don't want that. So we declare those, uh, those constructors as anonymous types. And this way it's impossible to, to, to match against those constructors, except for using this uh, this function. <clears throat> so um, let's shortly describe it in a more formal way. Um, <clears throat> so put next to each other, we declare the first thing is to declare a type using decomposition. In Pascal, you would create, you would uh, declare a type using the constructors. In 
TypeScript or other languages, you use the decomposition of that type. Apart from that, it's just declaring a type and, well, the constructors that you want to use. The next thing is to declare the constructors themselves. So uh, in Haskell, it's still the same declaration because uh, you declare uh, them in one go. In, uh, in TypeScript, you declare those two functions. One calls the match nothing, one calls the match just done. And then you can, you, you can immediately profit from this. So all the functions that you can write in Haskell using the uh, pattern matching on that type, you can write in other languages as well. The is nothing function that just tells you whether a maybe is nothing or not. Well, you match nothing, you match just, return false and true. You match nothing, you match just, return false and true. I formatted it that way so uh, it actually, uh, so you can actually see the different, uh, so it, it really looks like the, the pattern matching itself. You can, so uh, it also kind of depends on what kind of code formatting you use, of course, uh, that it looks really similar to the, um, to the original Haskell pattern matching. Um, same thing for the or else function, for example. You have, uh, in a nothing case, you return the fallback. In a just case, you return the thing. The only thing is that you, you don't have the named nothing and just constructors. They are just, but well, they are kind of implicit. That's the only, the only difference. Um, yeah, uh, one, so let's move, to, move on to another example. One type that I have actually implemented a lot of times because uh, uh, so the, the either type basically encodes uh, the, the possibility of failure. You either have a left thing that's usually some kind of error, or you have a right thing. The right thing you have what you actually want, and um, this is very useful because uh, in in most object-oriented languages you have exceptions for exceptional errors, but uh, not all errors are ex exceptional. A lot of errors are actually kind of expected. Um, and for those, to, to, to use except exceptions for those expected errors often um, is more tedious, um, especially in, in, in systems that, are, that should be designed to, to be resilient, um, but then you, uh, you end up with, a, with an uncaught exception that you should have caught but didn't, and then it falls through and your application crashes. Yes, I think this is more, the, the more important aspect about this is, is that uh, you're not forced to catch the exceptions. Yes, yes. Yes, because they are for exceptional circumstances. And uh, with the either type, you, you directly communicate that you are actually, that you have to deal with this. Um, with this case, it's not exceptional. It's expected. It, it is expected. And the either, so you have the left and right constructors, the left and right uh, patterns here. You have um, then you have the left and right constructors defined by the pattern matching. And then I need my mouse. And then you can add the uh, oh two more my mouse on the correct screen. <clears throat> and then uh, you can define functions like is left, is right, flip that just swaps the two so uh, it, it turns a right into a left and a left into a right, or, uh, or mapping over, the, uh, over the, the, the right value. So uh, if, you have a, if you have a right thing, then it applies a function to it, and if you don't, if you're a left thing, then, then it just leaves it. And, well, the, the, the TypeScript code basically looks the same. It matches if you have a left thing, returns true, right thing, returns false, and so on. So, uh, in usage, this pattern is very, very compact and very much like the, the original functional code. <clears throat> So, I promise you in any programming language, which is, of course, not entirely true. 
um, any language, you, you probably won't be able to do it. And someone asked me about Fortran. Um, probably not. Um, you need two key ingre ingredients. That's um, you need interfaces or some way to declare a type without uh, without much much else. So interfaces are the usual way, but you can also use abstract classes if uh, that's uh, all your language uh, supports. And the other thing is you need lambdas. You need some kind of anonymous functions. Um, but if you have those two, and most modern languages actually uh, uh, support this, then you can do it in any other language. Java, for example. So the only I didn't use Java for all the other examples, even though I've written most of those ADTs in Java. Um, it's because function syntax is just horrible in Java. So declaring the a function type, although the client code actually looks very nice again, looks the same. <clears throat> yeah, um, and you can. So uh, C++ uh, nowadays supports lambdas, JavaScript, TypeScript. Okay, JavaScript doesn't have a type system, so <coughs> the point with type lambda calculus is kind of moot. Uh, but apart from that, any modern language will do. Um, and uh, yeah, so in what cases should I use this? Um, for most types of classes, you, you would write in, in uh, in, uh, in object-oriented uh, programming, you should probably not use this. But there are some, um, some applications where this comes in very handy and where I've used it multiple times. So that's, of course, the, the, those kind of standard algebraic data types like the ones I presented, maybe either, pair, and so on. They, it's, it's very easy to, if you once uh, memorize this pattern and can get used to it. It's very easy to write those uh, those data types from scratch within one hour. So um, I've actually done a similar talk already with live coding, where I just implemented maybe and either within 15 minutes or something like that. So it's very easy to write. Then of course syntax trees. The prime application for the visitor pattern, and also one of the well. <coughs> Kind of the, the prime examples where Haskell really shines, syntax trees. Um, I've also used it for, for parsed config files. So you, you parse, you have different alternatives for uh, how, we, how you specify the configuration. You have a parser that creates one instance or the other, and when you, when you evaluate that config file, you simply use this pattern to, to match whether you have, for example, whether you want to write to a file or to, uh, I've used it for writing to file or Kafka. Um, you just switch out the, the configuration file, uh, whether you want to, to use one backend or the other, and uh, the, the pattern matching will decide which backend to use. And then of course, should I use it? Um, well, yes, for those applications, definitely. You may have to explain it to your coworkers, but luckily, um, both people with a functional background, well, you, you wouldn't have to convince them, right? Uh, because they already know and love uh, ADTs, and people with a, um, with a, with a background in object-oriented programming, well, it's a gamma four pattern. It's called the visitor pattern, right? So they probably should know their uh, their object-oriented patterns, and so they hopefully are also uh, easy to 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 convince to to use this pattern, or at least that you use it. And yeah, that's it for me. Thank you very much for listening. And we, I think, we have five minutes for questions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Nice. Thank you very much. programming, uh, things like um, continuation passing style and so on can be uh, quite, um, can, can uh, speed up your code because mm -hmm. um, their function composition is cheap. Yeah. Uh, you just uh, uh, compose some functions and that's over one basically. Yeah, is, is actually in, 
early Haskell, parking matching was implemented exactly in that way, just under the hood. Um, and it was, uh, it turned out to be, to be too slow. Um, what in, in, so in, uh, in OP languages, you have, uh, you have subtyping and you have virtual calls. And those are what makes this slow, but those are also what makes um, what makes any uh, subtyping slow. So there shouldn't be a difference between uh, between using subtypes uh, for for example the, the maybe type with nothing and with a nothing class and a just class should have the same performance characteristics, and that's probably why in Java 8 the the optional type is actually not implemented via subtyping. But we are, if the thing is null, then do one thing. If it's not null, then uh, do the other thing, because it's just, uh, it's faster, yes. On the other hand, probably you won't, you, you won't really have a performance, uh, a, a performance hit that large. So probably it's premature optimization if you, if you, uh, if you optimize for performance here. Of course, if your if your performance is really critical, then you also shouldn't be using Java or TypeScript, right? So, next question. Yes. 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 And you don't have named uh, named patterns as opposed to Haskell, yeah. So it doesn't really work for very, for example, for syntax trees, where a lot of, where you have a lot of options and a lot of options look the same, then it probably doesn't work any, uh, as good anymore. Um, for, uh, you, of course, you get some documentation from, if you use an IDE, and you name your patterns accordingly. So I always use match nothing, match just. Um, so I get, I simply get the, the, the information from my IDE that I actually should use, should match for nothing here, should match for just here. So, but yes, the, the documentation doesn't, is not directly in the code, but rather something the IDE provides to me, which is good enough for me. But at least in TypeScript, you could just use an object as an argument to accept. That's true, that's true. In TypeScript, that TypeScript I could, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, JavaScript. Sorry, it works in JavaScript as well, of course. Yeah. Um, but you don't get the the convenience. Uh, for, of course, the the convenience that you get from a static type system in, type, in, in JavaScript. But so yes, it works. Yeah. yeah. Yes, you could definitely. Could. Um, yeah. Just ask a last mm -hmm. I saw you last question. Script. It's totally not related to, to talk as a TypeScript question. This class extends, what does that mean? Um, it's an anonymous class. Okay, what's the difference? Is it just an object type without the class extends? It just yeah, then, then you couldn't, uh, then you couldn't, add. so basically the, the, the class I added is for extension methods. So I can uh, declare functions on the maybe type uh, as opposed to always declare the, the, the operations on the type externally. But it's a question of flavor. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.